Going back to, to the description of my today's lesson, it's going to be on judgment call because in chess, sometimes there, there are confusing positions where um, you may um, you may have a choice between two or more moves that look uh, equally good. And um, I would like to introduce you guys to, to my way of making a decision when I'm presented with when I'm presented with a choice uh, between two equally good looking uh, options. So I have I have two of my games here to show you um what goes into my uh, decision making process whenever I'm presented with a situation just like in this game. So this this is uh, my game from uh from the Spice Cup Open uh in 2020. I, I was playing Grandmaster um, Titus Trim of Vicious. I'm playing with Black Pieces, and this is why we're seeing this from Black's perspective. And yeah, in this in this position, my opponent played Queen A1. Uh, do keep in mind that uh, at this point, my opponent this is obviously a classical game, and my opponent here had uh, approximately three minutes left on his clock, while I had over twenty minutes, which means that I was in a uh, in a in a great spot time wise. And let's just take a look at this position and see what's what's going on. So at this point, I'm I'm clearly up a pawn. I have five pawns versus white's four pawns. Uh, uh, every other material seems to be equal. So I have two knights and a queen. White has queen, knight, and a bishop. But if you do notice, what what is happening here is that white is clearly attacking my pawn on a7, and even though. Right now, it may seem that I can just eat the knight for free, right? Since I have two attackers against the knight versus a single defender, a bishop on e5, I'm actually going to be losing this knight back by force because white can simply take my pawn with a check. Now, uh, if my king goes um, back there, obviously I lose control over the over the knight, knight on f6 and and lose it right away as a result. Um, but if my king goes to e6. Now we can uh, white can perform a skewer by attacking my king from either b6 or a6, and and when they're basically going to win my knight um, in a very similar manner. So as soon as I lose the knight, my material advantage will be gone, and my king will still be kind of sort of in danger. Obviously, this does not look like a good option, and hence uh, I need to be kind of thinking about how to avoid losing the pawn on a7. If any of you guys in the chat want to take a minute and think about potential ways of avoiding the loss of the pawn on a7, what comes to your mind here? I'm going to give you guys a couple of minutes and then proceed onto the explanation. Queen a4, mage has, uh, mage has 57, very nice, queen a4. Uh, as you guys may notice, there is no way to directly defend the pawn on a7, right? So there's no piece in black's position that can directly defend it. We can block the attack by playing queen a4. This is the move that was made in the game. Um, but is there any other way, right? So this is this is a, a blocking move, right? Queen, queen to a4, it's, it's blocking the attack, it's offering the queen trade. What happens if, uh, what happens if white takes takes up on a trade well because white snat is still hanging right technically white white snat is still under attack but imagine white takes uh my knight on h7 but unfortunately in this case because white accepted the trade my pawn has become a pass pawn on, on the a file and can no longer be stopped by any of the white pieces mm -hmm. and this is why obviously accepting the trade is or, or not is but would would have been a fatal mistake for white so they didn't, they played queen to e1. But even here, at this point, 
right? I was presented with a, with a choice. Actually, <laughs> even in the original position, the idea that I was I was kind of trying to make you make you find is uh, is to play queen d1. But actually, your queen d1 here forces a trade of queens with a very similar idea to create myself a bunch of passed pawns that, that can then be used to you know to promote to be the queens or hopefully <laughs> maybe it won't work but who knows so here queen d1 would be even more effective because of the queen d1 white cannot avoid the trade right white has to accept the trade in d1 and this way if you guys notice i am going to be losing the piece right so just like in previous position where white accepted the trade on a4 right the, in this case white can also take minus on h7 basically for free so this way i'm going to find myself in this spot where I'm down a piece, but take a look at my pawns. This endgame is very, very unclear and it's really, really hard to calculate. Uh, without using the help of the computer, I'm going to tell you guys that with, with a very, very precise defense, white can indeed survive here. So it's not about whether white can win this position or not. White is trying to survive because in the end game, typically what happens is that the, the value of the pieces, of the white pieces, that is, is devaluated. And this is why you see, for example, in end games, such as two white pieces versus a rook, white pieces would typically be struggling against rook because rook will become way more agile than the pieces, right? In this case, the value of the white pieces are uh, the value of the white pieces is devaluated due to the fact that my pawns are uh, so so advanced already, and they basically require no close to no help. Oops. I wish my drawing skills were better. So my pawns require close to no help um to keep going forward and this is why it is really really difficult for white to take a good advantage of their extra piece because they have to immediately go back go back off and try to stop my pawns from promoting and unsurprisingly so the only move for white here to not lose the game immediately is to play d5 which ensures the help of the bishop so this way white gives back there, white, white gives me the pawn, and if you notice, right now this position is in full material balance because white has an extra piece, while I have three pawns for it. Um, but thanks to the bishop on e5, it seems, it appears that white's going to be just on time and stopping my pawns from promoting. But do remember, when I was talking about the original position, I, I said that in this case, white has almost no time on their clock meaning that they will have a very like, they will have almost no time to think about their moves and if i play queen a4 and if you follow my my decision during the game which wasn't to play queen d1 right because i thought to myself that if i go into an end game this makes it easier for my opponent to navigate because well the fewer the amount of pieces on the board the easier it is to navigate because you don't have to calculate as much but what i didn't take into account is the fact that if I avoid the end game, which I did by playing knight takes f6, queen takes e3, I didn't really realize how powerful white's counterattack will be on the king's side against my my king and my knight. So this position, surprising to my big surprise, like after the game I analyzed this position and realized that I simply cannot avoid losing back my some my material or stopping white from from getting a perpetual check of some kind. So let, let me show you guys how the game ended. I played queen d1. So in this case, once again, since I'm at material, my um, my goal is to trade as many pieces as I possibly can. And because both white queen and white bishop are so annoying, ideal case scenario would be for me to trade both of them and go into a pawn endgame where I'm up a pawn. So I played queen d3. Unfortunately, this runs into a very specific issue and that issue is queen to g5 so during the game i was i thought to myself that oh but maybe i can just play queen f5 here right so this move would offer an immediate trade would offer an immediate trade of queens while also defending the knight on f6 at the same time however once again there is a problem with this please take a minute and tell me what is the issue with this move
Bishop takes f6, mage has saving the day. Yes, correct. Bishop takes f6, forces a trade of, of the trade of white pieces, and this time I'm gonna lose one of the pawns back. This is not the end of the world. I can actually win <laughs> the pawn right back by force by playing queen f4 check, and then playing queen c1. Right, this would be a double attack against the king and the pawn. What has no other way other than to play king h2? Then I would take, and in this case, we have transposed into a queen endgame where I'm up a pawn. Unfortunately, due to uh, forced nature of this endgame, my king will find itself in a situation where it cannot avoid perpetual checks. White can just start checking, and if I'm not careful enough, <laughs> I, may in, I may even get myself into a bit trouble by blundering checkmates, such as this one. Uh, this doesn't have to happen, I can just go right back to where I came from, and it, the, the game would end in a draw because my king essentially cannot run anywhere from the checks. So this is the problem, and this is what I, this is the idea that I kind of missed out in the game. I did not, or I, I underestimated White's counterattack against my king, and uh, I let the queen get even more active by playing ad7. So now I cannot stop the queen from reaching e7 square, which begins a series of, of checks that unfortunately I cannot avoid in the long run. So I can avoid the checks up until this point, but here, after white checks me from e3, to keep avoiding checks, I need to make a decision of whether I want to play g5 or not. If I don't play g5 and simply go back to where I came from, then the check will, will go on and the game will likely end in a draw because no side is making progress. So I had to play g5, and then, to my big surprise, I realized that even though I did manage to avoid the checks, my pieces are all tied up, tied down, right? Because any any time I try to move anything, the white queen will just go behind behind the lines and start checking me again. Uh, Rezan eighty seven, hello there, good to see you. We are I'm doing a lecture on um, uh, it's it's a decision making lecture. It's it's about judgment call between between the two equally good options. So as you guys can tell at this point, the the, the game is pretty much uh, drawn. So checks persisted and and uh, eventually uh, eventually we agreed on a draw. So the idea of this um of this particular example is that sometimes what may seem like a like a smart decision is not a correct decision in the long run because queen d1 in this case would be a smarter option, right? Because even though we are going an endgame, this is a very, very tough endgame for white, not only because white is white is, has almost no time, but also because this is a very unclear situation, right? This is there, there is material imbalance. In an endgame, while I have three connected pass pawns, right? Connected pass pawns on their own is already a very big deal in the endgames. But in this case, my knight will be will be helping them out by supporting them from behind. So this is this is a kind of judgment call that's that's really hard to make unless uh, unless you can you can calculate everything perfectly. And because I was also um, kind of running short on time, I decided to go to I decided against this, even though practically speaking, there is close to no risk for me in this case. And uh, White is the only one who can lose. So this was this was the the first example. Um, off we go to the second one. It worked, right? No? Yes. Okay. Second example. <laughs> I like this this one a lot because um, this was uh, a game I played against my uh, my good friend Ray Robson. And uh, we played this game in St. Louis Spring Classic <laughs> Tournament, which is about to happen in, in less than a month. So it's gonna, I'm going to be playing in basically the same tournament in approximately three weeks, and Ray will be playing there as well. So we will have, a, we'll have, a, we'll have another shot of playing each other. Um, this game was played in 2019, so that's, it's been three years since then. And, uh, and yeah, um, at this point... It's obviously back to moon once again. I'm playing with black pieces here, and um, I have um, a, ver a very clearly defined issue at this point, or at least it is very clearly defined for me. 
Um, and in this case, if you guys notice, what most of voice pieces are already out, and the only two pieces that they kind of still need developing are are the two rooks. But they, it, it's kind, of, it is kind of clear where the white rooks are gonna go, right, on, on both of the open files. While in my case, I still have, right, I still have my queen side not completely decided. So with this in mind, I believe a very logical looking move would be something like Rezan says knight c6. I I think knight c6 is definitely definitely is a move, but I um, during the game I, I did consider knight c6. The only reason for why I decided against it is because it creates me creates me a weakness, right? A weakness on c6. c6 pawn um, becomes weak and if white simply doubles their rooks on the c file like so it will be a little bit annoying for me to uh, to do to do something about the c6 pawn, right? The c6 pawn is a pawn that requires protection all the time, and yes, I see that I do see a very a very good good move in the chat. J Robert Gr pointed out that knight d7 is just a better version of knight c6. It accomplishes the same thing. It offers an even trade, um, but at the same time, if if the knight trade does happen. We are not creating ourselves any any more weaknesses. In fact, we have a perfect not perfect symmetry. If if black queen and bishop were swapped places, we would have perfect symmetry. But I mean, this is I would say this this also can, this can also be considered a symmetrical position. It's pretty close. Um, well, <laughs> in in symmetrical positions like this one, I believe it it would be very hard for either side to uh, to make any kind of progress. So uh, definitely would be you know. Would be a would be a good candidate to, you know, if I if I wanted if I wanted the game to conclude in a peaceful result, <laughs> but I had but I had other ideas. So in this case, right, like you may think, okay, so th this position does not seem like anything black can possibly play for a win because well, white's ahead in development and and black is the one who is currently experiencing uh, an issue an issue of where to develop the remaining pieces. Um, however, there is a way. Right, so knight d7 is a, is an obvious and good option, right? This option is good because it allows me to simply get an equal position and, and play a normal game with no complications. But, right, so I obviously did see knight d7 during the game, but I also I also saw a, a different kind of move, a move that may not be as peaceful as knight d7, but it 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 creates uh, an opportunity for my opponent to go wrong, or to, or not. I wouldn't say that it it was it created an opportunity for white to go wrong, but it definitely created a, a more dynamic position in the long run. So if you guys think about how to combine the goal of developing the queen set pieces with the goal of keeping the position more dynamic, which move comes to your mind? Queen b6, I see queen b6, rook e8. Okay, let's take a look at queen b6. It's an interesting, interesting option. There's queen h4, rook e8. Okay, so I see a lot of, I see a lot of uh, uh, attempts. You, I would say you guys are close, but so far nobody hit a spot. So let's take a look at queen b6. Queen b6 is an interesting decision. So you are, black, black is trying to attack the pawn on b2. Okay. Well, technically, I'm not really sure if black is black queen is doing anything on b6. So Im imagine imagine white makes a random move. So I'm just I'm just trying to prove a point here is that queen b6 doesn't really accomplish anything. So imagine I play h3. The move doesn't change much for white. If we take on b2, white will play queen b1. Right now my queen is trapped, so the only square it can go back to is to a3. Queens get traded and I lose my I lose the extra pawn right back. But you see I lost it while giving white a possibility of making the, the rook extremely active because it got to the 7th rank and on 7th rank it's taking control over a couple of very very 
important squares that my pieces would definitely like to be on. Well, they can't anymore because of the rook. So I would say queen b6 is, is a nice looking move, but it doesn't really accomplish much. Also, with your queen on b6, if you notice, you can no longer play knight c6. Imagine white still plays h3. If you play knight c6, there is, there is knight d7, which forks the queen and the rook. So queen b6 is... Uh, it's it's okay. I'm pretty sure it's fine, but it's it's not what we're looking for. Uh, let's take a look at rook e8. Another suggestion. So rook e8 has a uh, a more defined idea. We're simply just attacking the net on e5. Okay. So that definitely keeps keeps attention going. Keeps a tension, not attention, tension going. Uh, what if white plays rook to e1? So just simple attack, simple defense. Nothing more, nothing else. I think we can still we can still obviously opt for knight d7 if we want to 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 keep the game uh, kind of safe and calm. If we take on e5, actually, I'm, I was seriously considering taking on e5 during the game, but I wasn't uh, ultimately I wasn't really a big fan of this decision just because of um, of the weakness of my d5. Or now the d5 gets gets open up and white's point is really easy, really simple. Eventually, white will do something like this and put will start putting pressure against my d5 pawn, so I eventually opted against this idea. Um, <laughs> well, there's only one more thing left, technically, right? So rook e8 is a nice looking move, but I'm not sure who, who this move favors. Yes, both sides get the rook, get the rook on the open file, but because white, white, white's e1 rook is connected and my e8 rook isn't connected with my other rook, I think this, if I ever get to trade the rooks, the trade will favor white, right? Because white will will get to uh, to control the e-file. So I wouldn't be so sure by saying that the rook e8 benefits me more than my opponent. Well, but I do like rook e8 a lot because it, it, it deals with an, with an issue. The issue being, that's not really an issue, but it's it's an annoyance. The knight on e5 is not letting my knight get out without offering a trade. Right, so with this in mind, which move have I made during the game? If it's not rook e8, there's only a... Uh, Maybe a couple more options. Knight a6, well, knight a6, <laughs> knight on a6 is uh, not exactly a piece I would like to have, right? It's on the edge. It does have a prospect of going somewhere to e6, but it takes time. Also, after knight a6, doesn't white have something like queen b5? Queen b5 looks extremely annoying because it's, uh, it's double attacking the pawns. I'm not even sure how to deal uh, with, with the queen b5 other than other than take on e5. But once again, by taking on e5, I kind of accept the fact that I will be playing with, with a weak pawn, right? with, a, with a weakness on d5. So knight e6, yeah, not quite. Yes, yes, mate, chest clear of 57, you got it, I played f6. And this this is definitely a, a, a way more, a way riskier decision, well, because it creates an additional weakness and and it basically baits white into playing the next move. Right now, it's, it's clear that that I'm creating myself a very big weakness on, on this diagonal, and white thought that they can take advantage of this immediately, and and with a little bit of a, of a calculation, my opponent has found this pretty strong move, queen b3, right? So now, the issue for me here is that if I if I take on e5, right, if I, if I, if I accept the sacrifice, there is a series of tactical hits, right? So queen takes b7, obviously not queen to queen takes d5, because after queen takes d5, I can block the check with rook f7, d takes e5, and bishop c7. And this way I retain the extra piece, though for a couple of pawns, but still, it's a material advantage nonetheless. Well, white doesn't have to go for this, obviously. They can start by taking on b7 first which is a much better option. Right now, my, my rook is in trouble. If, if, this, if this rook was not in trouble, I would say that my position is just perfectly fine. But because the rook on a8 is in trouble, I you know, I have to give, give some of the material back, and I think the only way to do so, obviously not knight d7. If knight d7, white has queen takes d5, and because now my knight is blocking the queen on d8, I'm going to end up losing the bishop on d6, and as you guys notice in this position, I'm not up anything in fact i'm down two pawns how does that happen nobody knows but that's a fact <laughs> sometimes 
sometimes you play a game and then and then you 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 get yourself into a weird tactic and then and then by the end of the tactic you you suddenly realize that you're missing a knight or you're missing a piece and then, and then you wonder how did that happen well um i can avoid i can avoid some of the um some of the um, material losses by doing this. So in this case, I'm only down a pawn. Obviously, white cannot take on d4 because then they get hit with a, a, a very, very uh, nice and simple discovery attack. I'm not even going to ask you guys to find this. I'm pretty sure everybody in the chat can, can see bishop takes h2, which wins a queen. But you see, the issue is that white does not have to do this. White can just, yeah, yeah. Yes, bishop takes h2 is correct, white, but unfortunately white does not have to take on, on d4. Instead, they can just bring the queen back to d3, and, uh, and in this case, white is going to retain the extra pawn, and it's 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 going to be, it's not going to be fun, you know, despite the fact that I do have an extra, oh, not an extra, sorry, despite the fact that I do have a pass pawn on d4, still be, being down a pawn is a, you know, is a, is a, is a big disadvantage. Plus, this is a, this is technically a middle game. If this was, you know, closer to an end game where my pawn is is passed and and it's very very difficult for white to stop us, then it would be a different story. But now there's a lot of pieces in white's position that can stop my pawn, especially the queen that's already kind of coming to d3. Okay, so if we go back over here, this basically means that. I cannot take on e5 with, with a pawn. Well, fortunately for me, taking on e5 with a bishop does change things. So how does it change things? Well, let's take a look what happened in the game. My opponent took, I took on e5, white took on b7, right? These are all kind of happening by force. And in this case, I am <laughs> I am losing the rook on a8. I am not a big fan of playing any of the knight moves, right? Because any of knight c6 or knight a6 moves will cost me a knight. Knight d7 move will cost me a pawn in d5, and I'm going to play down a pawn, which once again is not ideal. I do not want to be down material. So I, I, I'm i I'm fortunate enough to have a move queen d7 here. So this move is going to cost me the rook, but fortunately, after white does take the rook, their queen gets trapped. This leads into a very, very interesting materially imbalanced endgame. Right, so I play knight c6, now white queen is trapped. They have to give it up for as much as possible, as, as expansively as possible, and therefore they, they take my other rook. So if we just if we just count raw material here, we would we would find out that white's white has extra material, right? Because what we have equal amount of pawns. Equal amount of light pieces, however, white does have two rooks, which are worth five points each, versus a queen, which is worth nine points. Meaning that white's technically, materially speaking, white is up one point of material. However, what we probably did not take into consideration first while looking at the raw material is the positioning of the pieces. If you notice, white's rooks are still on their starting positions. So, okay, technically the f1 rook isn't, because it has been castled. But nevertheless, it's not an open file yet. Also, I'm not sure. I'm not sure if you guys know about synergy between pieces. So, um, there is so there is that there is a thing called synergy between heavy and light pieces, and and queen is known to work very well alongside with a knight because these two pieces supplement each other. Not, queen cannot cannot move as a knight, so. <laughs> When they work together, they work really well. And the same thing can actually be can actually be said about rooks and, and bishops. Because, well, if you kind of combine a rook and a bishop, you get a queen. Which means that, <laughs> technically speaking, the rook the rooks are supplemented by the bishops, making them into many, many queens. So in this case, both sides have a very nice piece synergy. However, I do have a another advantage to my position which is a strong center right so i have two two strong central pawns which are ready to go right they are ready to to be pushed up and it's going to be very difficult for white to stop them so let let me show you guys what happened in the game in this position my opponent made a an inaccuracy it was actually a much bigger deal so my i think my opponent still thought that they they are 
their position is superior because they are material, so they were trying to uh, create an additional advantage by trading pawns on the queen side. So what what my opponent's plan was is basically keep pushing the queen side pawns until until they get traded and until white gets a passer on the queen side, right? So white played b4. Hello, Gilly. 8-8 EV. White played b4 here, intending, right, for their next move to be either b5 or a4. Uh, unfortunately, white has forgotten that moves at b4 create a lot, a lot of weaknesses, especially because there is nothing in white's position to take care of white's squares where my queen b, let's say, on a4 at this point, if my queen could magically get to a4, there is no piece in white's position to, to get it out of there. And since white's plan is clearly to, pray, to play a4, my queen being on a4 is a very big problem, right? So with this in mind, what do you guys think, I, what do you guys think my next move was? If I, if I know that white's idea is to play a4, what, is there, what, what can I do to try and stop it? 94. Perfect. Perfect, Stefan. You're correct. 94. Also, as, well, as, you, as you guys know, knights in the middle are monsters. Right? Knight, this knight is in the center. It's a monstrous piece. Nobody wants to deal with a knight like this. This knight has way too many things going on its way. So, a4 runs into knight b3. Well, it's an interesting point, but I feel like well, first of all, you're correct. Knight b3 is definitely an option. I, I don't think it does. I don't think it wins me anything immediately. So white can still play rook a2. This defends the bishop. I don't think I want to trade, right? So because my knight can always come back to the, to d4 and be very strong in the center, while white's bishop is not really doing as much. At this point, right? At this point, I can just, yeah, yeah. If knight takes d2, rook takes d2. I would lose a pawn on the pawn on d5, and then this would be another even trade. And yes, this this endgame, I'm pretty sure it's heavily favored for uh, for white because all they have to do to win my pawn is to just simply double up on the a file, and it's going to be it. So obviously, I cannot let this happen, meaning that I cannot accept the trade offer. But what I can do is I can just do this, right? And at this point, it's funny, but white is paralyzed. White, there is nothing white can do to keep pushing their pawns. If white tries to attack my pawn on a7, well, it's, it's not going to work, right? If bishop e3, I can just simply play d4. So because white's pieces are so passive, and my, and my pieces, and I, I, don't, I don't really have that many pieces, I only have what, a queen and a knight, technically. So because, because of such a drastic difference in piece activity, despite the fact that I'm down material, right? This is something that you guys, you guys saw in the previous lecture, I believe. In the end of the previous lecture, Right with Alex, black was was down material. Nevertheless, because of how active their pieces were, they were they were trying to win the game. They had an advantage, and this 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 just lives to to show you guys that material is not everything. You should always ask yourself a question: What are your pieces doing? If you have an extra piece, it has to be it has to be in the game. It has to be working. Otherwise, it doesn't count. Right. So in this case. White's plan was to play a5, b6. Well, it's not going to work, right? Because my queen is taking is taking care of both of the pawns. If white pawn, if a pawn moves up, the b the b5 pawn is gone, right? Well, if that's if that's how things are, then white's only plan has failed. And well, I don't, I think this position just simply lost for white because well, I have a very clearly defined plan. I just want to queen eventually. So, uh, <laughs> I'm not sure. If, maybe white can try and stop me, but it's you know, when you're defending while being up material, it, it says something, right? It says something that something has gone wrong somewhere. So this is why, yeah, this is why Ray realized that a4 is probably not the best idea anymore. And he played king h1, but once again, we know, <laughs> we know the issue with, um, with not playing a4. Now a4 square becomes available for my queen to, to go to. So that's what happened. I played queen a4. And interestingly enough, Ray made a decision to to just give up his extra material, right? So at this point, as we determined previously, 
white is up one point of material so which basically equals to one single pawn so just to make sure that his pieces can get a little bit more activity ray made a very practical decision i believe in that very very short period of time that he he had left on his clock he played b5 here attempting to play b6 right so this way white is trying to open up the files for 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 his rooks well i'm afraid i couldn't really do anything about the b6 idea so i just accepted the material back and moved into this position so at this point since the rooks has the rooks have become so active new problems arise for me at least right because the rooks are so powerful especially when they're connected rooks are the rooks are extremely powerful and annoying if if they both get onto the seventh string with something like this my king will be in, in grave danger so i had to address the issue immediately <laughs> and i found a really really interesting solution to to the problem of king safety here well because the king cannot really be defended by anything on, on the right side of it, right? So here, these three squares cannot be blocked by any of my pieces. I, I thought to myself, well, what if I just move the, my king behind the pawns, right? And by behind the pawns, I mean behind my king side pawns. And therefore, I played h6, rook b1. And here, I think I made a mistake, I believe. So I... I I, at this point, I thought that I can play king g8 at any point. I should have done it immediately, by the way. But I played queen c4 instead. And at this point, there was some kind of weird tactic. I can maybe even... Let me see if I can cheat a little bit and, and, and take a look at the engines. About uh, It's going to screw up everything, right? If I do this. Not everything. It screwed up a few things. But yeah, there there is some... Okay, there is there is some... There is some rook b7, and the idea of rook b7. Okay, is this better now? Let's see. I closed it. It's not better, is it? Huh? No. Uh, okay, so I see. I see what you. I see what you meant when you said it's the the that. Uh, I mean, I can fix it myself. Not 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 a big deal. Here, I got I got this. There we go. Here, here, like this. Sorry, guys. Uh, a little bit of of technical difficulty present here. Um. Up. A little bit better. I mean, it's not as good as it used to be, but it's it's workable, right? <laughs> we can work with this. Is it is this uh, Ray versus Ilya? Yes, this this game. Yes, this is my game against Ray from 2019. We played this during uh, a Saint Louis Spring Spring Invitational tournament. That's actually gonna it's actually about to happen. It's right around the, the corner. It's happening in about three weeks in the beginning of March, and Ray is playing there too. So we're actually gonna get a get a chance to play each other again okay so so here yeah so at this point there was yeah there was some weird weird tactic which which Ray did not find he played rook e7 which allowed me to play king, king h7 and hide my king essentially so obviously if 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 only white's king was on g1 at this point right if only this king was on g1 at this point white could have played rook b7 and they would have gotten a lot of counterplay on the seventh rank but because the king is an h1, obviously rook b7 fails to queen f1. Checkmate. Well, the issue is clear. The solution also pretty clear. If white wants to play rook b7, they need to do they need to make sure the king doesn't get checkmated. How do we do that? Well, simple, right? Just h3. Now I played knight d4. Rook b7. Well, once again, white doesn't really have much to do other than try to create some kind of counterplay. Otherwise, because of how strong my queen alongside with the knight are, and having the central pawns on top of that would be a huge deal or huge problem for white. So rook b7 happened. I have the only defense, right? So rook g7 is 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 threatening, and I need to I need to do something about this. I don't wanna I don't wanna get checkmated, so I need to defend the g7. 
This is why I played knight f5. Knight f5 is, is great. It's it's both attacking and defending uh, the, the pawn on g7. Uh, not leaving white with, with that many options, right? If white, let's say, plays rook f7 here, I would play queen f1 check, king h2, and queen takes f2. So this this way, I'm, now I'm officially up material. If we look at at a true a true um, widely known values of, of each piece, which in my opinion is rarely a correct way of evaluating each is the strengths of each each piece on the board. But anyway, at this point, I'm up a pawn, right? I just I just ate a pawn on f2. I'm attacking the bishop on d2. I'm defending my own knight on f5. And now, most importantly, I have two connected pass pawns that do not have that do not have any uh, any um any with a vis uh, on any of the of any of the uh, adjacent and uh, and e and d files. Well, rook takes e5 is probably the least of the worst that Ray could have done. Actually, at this point, I believe both queen takes f2 and knight to h4 was winning, but I decided to go for a prettier, for a prettier option at h4. Well, why is it prettier? Well, because I'm forcing my opponent's king into the corner, and well, because the corner is not exactly the ideal uh, position for the for for the king to be on, especially when the queen is present on the board. I thought that I actually have a very good chance of. Of, uh, of checkmating <laughs> checkmating white's king or if the checkmating thing doesn't work i can at least maybe uh, maybe win a rook or two right because now i'm threatening queen d4 or queen f4 queen f4 is obviously i think even more scary than queen d4 but nevertheless um it was hard to to avoid both so, so ray decided to make sure that both rooks stay intact uh, unfortunately at this point um, the position is at Zugzwang. At this point, any move that white makes, well, I played d4, so any move that white makes leads to them either losing a rook or getting checkmated. So in this case, if, let's say, white plays h4, the king gets completely trapped, so I have to checkmate on f3. And if the rooks move elsewhere, let's say if the rook moves anywhere on, on the e-file, the, there is checkmate on g5. And if the rook moves anywhere on the on the fifth fifth rank, which actually did happen, I can win the rook one of the rooks by force. Can you guys find a forced a forced way of winning one of the rooks? I'll give you a minute. Yes. Yeah, yes, centipede, correct. Queen to f3 check, king's force back to h4, and then queen f6 with double attack. Which was the end of the game, and Ray resigned. So, once again, uh, this is, I, feel like, I feel like this lecture about judgment call is, uh, is a, little, a little bit tricky to, to um, explain in, in a lot of detail, but this is something that I, I really like about I'm basically showing you guys um, uh, this particular topic because um, I my favorite player is Magnus Carlsen I believe this is this is exactly uh, um, a, a something that Magnus does very well as you guys can tell f6 is by the way not by any by any means the best move in the position right the best move in, the, in this position in the original position is knight to d7 which keeps which keeps the balance going but f6 leads to to materially imbalanced position, but it gives it gives your opponent a chance to to misstep, right? So if um, if you're if you're playing for or if you're trying to create some kind of play in, in a very boring position, then moves like f6 is a, moves like f6 are definitely your way to go. And also, you 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 shouldn't forget that the time. Uh, the time, the remaining time on the clock is also a big factor while making such decisions. So in this case, Ray was once again uh, a little bit, a little bit. He had a little bit less time than, than myself, and I knew that if uh, if I can get uh, if I can get the position into a, into a, an unclear and imbalanced territory, that then because of 
um, my time, time advantage, I would have a higher chance of navigating through it better than my opponent. And in the first example, if you guys remember, the situation was, was kind of similar, but in that case, I, I didn't realize that the position that, that would appear uh, in the materially imbalanced endgame where I would, would be down down a piece um, would also be very, very tricky to navigate um, as as for me as much as for my opponent. So I, I, I did not make, in that case, I did not make the correct judgment call by, by, um, by making it happen. How long am I teaching this class? Well, technically this is already kind of over. <laughs> I mean, this was this was my last example. I didn't. I honestly did not expect myself uh, to go through this so quickly. But it's it's it should be about it should be about one hour. Uh, what what do I think about about Perugia next world champion? When well well he's he's definitely an ex extremely strong player and and he's been he's been showing a, a yeah a, a great deal to to improvement. Right? He's he's been improving nonstop for. For the past however many years and he doesn't seem to to be stopping anytime soon and that's definitely a great thing when when you're talking about improvement and on, on, on a level as high as as high as 2800 right that's basically um that's basically the, the the top top three and and for somebody to to be constantly improving and reaching that that high of a level is definitely extremely impressive and i do believe that Ferusha has an excellent chance of eventually becoming a world champion i'm not sure if he's if he is there yet, if he is ready, but we'll see. Um, he he will have his chance to to participate and you know to uh, to to maybe maybe earn his way of, of challenging Magnus and and um, and yeah, I wish him the best. If he deserves it, he will get it. Do remember to take into consideration other factors while you're making a decision of which move to make. And yeah, once again, those factors can be can vary from. The amount of time you have versus the amount of time your opponent has to uh to to the end to your end goal uh, whether you're trying to keep the position simple or 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 try to make it complicated <laughs>